indeed, I will try to, to start from the very beginning. So, of course, I apologize with people who have been working in this uh, field for at least some time. But uh, uh, we thought it is important to start from the very beginning to at least to uh, connect to everybody in the school as, as far as I understand there are people um, with very different backgrounds. So let me share the screen. Okay. Sure. You should see my... Uh, the full screen of my presentation. As uh, Paolo was saying, I'm going to talk about the quantum algorithm protocols, but started from, from the very beginning. So I'm not giving anything for granted. And uh, we will try to, to start from, if you want, the basic principles of quantum mechanics uh, to reread them. And uh, in terms of uh, what is really important for uh, quantum uh, computation. Uh, so uh, let me start by saying, that the, to, re, to recall you, maybe you know that very well, that the first person who actually uh, thought about uh, quantum computers, so the very first one who introduced the idea that we do need to have a quantum computer was Richard Feynman himself. You see him here. Uh, in a photograph of the first conference of um, what was called the first conference of physics and computation was given at MIT in 1982, so quite some time ago. And uh, in his talk that has been published, uh, I think in the international, I don't remember exactly where, but I can give you the reference a few months later, he was uh, uh, actually trying to understand what it means to really simulate nature. And since the nature is quantum, is governed by quantum mechanical laws, actually he said we would better make a quantum mechanical simulation. Uh, it took some time, as you can understand very well, to, to have in our hands something that can look like a quantum computer, a real quantum computer. And so we are trying now uh, to understand how it works. So uh, let me say that uh, we are all, the quantum theory is almost one century old, okay? So Heisenberg and Schrodinger papers are in, from 1925, 1926. And as you know, uh, quantum mechanics is one of the most, maybe the, the most debated and challenged theory in the history of physics, but also the most confirmed one. Okay, and what we really are able to now is to use basic principles of quantum mechanics. We, we say that we are in now in the era of, the, of a second quantum revolution that allows us actually to use the fundamentals of quantum theory to enhance the technology. Okay, and uh, uh, this is the time scale, of what is called the European quantum flagship uh, that you might know of. And uh, as you see in the timeline of, of these uh, quantum flagships, there are many things that we are going to encounter in the school. And what actually I should, I would like to look at in a little more detail is what it's here and are called the quantum simulators and uh, universal quantum computers. And just to give you some basic ideas of what we mean by these um, words. Uh, even in class, the classical uh, realm, we can talk about analog or digital quantum computers. Okay, we know of many uh, machines that actually are able to perform specific calculations uh, by reproducing the laws of some non physical system. Here, there are some examples. Uh, you might know of this uh, uh, of a mechanism which is called, which was found in the Greek island of Antiquity. Right? It's a first century before Christ old uh, mechanism that is supposed to reproduce the motion of the planets uh, in the sky. But the Fermi himself was working on similar mechanism in 1946, for example, he built what we now call a Fermiac, which is a mechanism to reproduce the calculation of the Newton scattering, for example. And we all know about wind galleries, okay, which are used to simulate uh, um, 
hydrodynamic properties of objects uh, because simply because uh, real calculations are really, really very hard. But you also use uh, what we can call universal computers, okay? All personal computers that we have uh, are actually based on chips that work on some universal gates and logic that will allow us to reproduce any algorithm by a suitable set of instructions. What about quantum? What, what happens to these ideas if you move now to the quantum world? The idea is actually you have something very similar. Indeed, also in the quantum world, we can talk about analog and digital uh, computers. In particular, when we are thinking of analogic objects, we are thinking uh, to, of uh, quantum simulators. Here, there are just some pictures taking some examples. And quantum simulators are, in general, made up of single call of, of multiple of, of, of cold atoms and ions that are trapped in with magnetic fields inside a specific region of space and trapped in specific position by means of optical potentials created by a set of lasers. And uh, uh, here you see some pictures in which each dot is actually a, a single atom. And uh, we are now able to manipulate each single atom or ion and to create very different geometries. We can uh, let uh, atoms to jump from one side to another with different hopping velocities. We are, uh, sorry, shouldn't be unable, should be tunable interactions. We have very tunable interaction. We can tune the interaction very easily among atoms. You can also use atoms with internal degrees of freedom. So mimicking particles with the internal or spin degrees of freedom. And you can even use uh, bosonic or, sorry, I don't know, is, I think this is a corrector the uh, automatic correction of the uh, should be bosonic and fermionic uh, statistics that you can uh, implement in such uh, objects. And the idea is that uh, since we have such a wide versatility to arrange and manipulate these objects, you're actually able to simulate the physics of many different systems. You can very clearly understand that uh, uh, these kind of simulators are very useful for condensed matter systems in which uh, if with standard solid state physics, uh, we have electrons moving in a lattice. We are, can essentially have no way to, for example, tune the velocity of the electrons, okay? Chemistry is fixing the, the lattice. So, so we are not free to choose the geometry of the lattice. In these uh, setups, instead, we have a very high versatility that allows us also to explore a uh, region of the parameter space that uh, are with standard solid state physics uh, objects uh, not uh, reachable. But what is really interesting and that actually what I'm, I'm working on is that uh, with these quantum simulators, you can uh, think of simulating fundamental interaction of particles, okay? So you can implement in these, uh, in these uh, cold atoms or ion system, uh, the fundamental laws of uh, physics like uh, QED, for example, or some gra or gravity, for example. It also exploit in uh, uh, geometry that are not easy reachable in, in other ways, okay? So this really gives you at least in principle, a very a, a big potentiality of, uh, of analysis. And it's clearly very challenging, but also very interesting. The other, but what actually I'm going to discuss today is the other version, so the digital version of what we mean by quantum uh, computer, okay? Which means that we want a universal object which is made up of fundamental information storage units that we will call qubits, and uh, which can be programmed in a universal way through algorithm and instructions, okay? Actually, this is not just uh, science fiction, as you know very well. There are many big companies and small companies that are actually now trying to build quantum digital computers, and uh, I'm just remind you, IBM, Google, Rigetti, 
that are all based on essential uh, uh, superconducting qubits uh, technology. But there are also other companies like IonQ, for example, or Pascal, but there are others in the world that instead use uh, cold uh, atoms or ions to, to construct also uh, uh, quantum digital computers. You might know that uh, uh, in, at the end, I think it was September of 2019, actually Google uh, came out with a paper claiming that they achieved quantum supremacy. So they were able to uh, um, perform a quantum computation that is unreachable by nowadays uh, classical computers. There was a big discussion about that afterwards. I'm not going to enter into that, but clearly we are now entering an era in which we can think that sooner or later quantum computer will be available and much more powerful than classical ones. So uh, I want to, what is the outline of my talk? And the idea that uh, uh, what I really would like to, the message I would like to, to send is that uh, is, I would like to, to be able to make you understand what a qubit is. So what is a standard uh, unit of quantum information and uh, how we can manipulate it, how it is manipulated uh, in, in a computer, not physically. I'm not going to enter in the technology, which is uh, dependent also on the kind of, uh, physical object that we are going to use, but what are the principles that govern the law of, of a qubit. So we will start by describing what we can, uh, how we can represent the state of one or more qubits to then go uh, and see in which way it is different from a standard bit, a classical bit. And uh, the, the difference is based on the basic principle of, of quantum mechanics, which essentially are linear superposition and entanglement. We are going to, to see that in detail. And then we will see how we can manipulate a qubit. So what are the, the laws that govern the, the evolution of, uh, of a qubit? And so we will discuss what we mean by a quantum gate. And uh, we'll end up also in giving some example of algorithms that are able to show the, how powerful quantum computers can be. Okay, and uh, some algorithm and protocols that actually cannot be done with classical computers, so something more. Okay, and then in the very last lecture, uh, I would like to discuss uh, uh, something about open system. What uh, today and tomorrow we will stick to closed systems, so we will think that the qubit will be just uh, an isolated quantum mechanical system that we can control by means of some Hamiltonian, okay, some Schrodinger equation, essentially. In the last lecture, instead, we will see what happens if we start thinking that actually our qubit is not isolated, we'll interact with other qubits, but also we'll interact with the environment and also with the, with the, the programmer itself, which is somehow also a classical world. And we will discuss a little bit about what we mean by the coherence and the channels so there. Okay, so let me start if there are no questions. Uh, and uh, by recalling the basic principle of quantum mechanics, okay, I'm not going to discuss them. As we see, we are going to uh, then uh, show how we can use this uh, principle of quantum mechanics to understand what the qubit is and how it works. So there are a few things that I'm just going to recall as also to, to for, I mean, uh, as a reminder to you. And uh, let me remind you, first of all, what we mean by state when we talk uh, about quantum mechanics. Uh, first of all, we should uh, define what a pure state is. And we say that the pure state is a ray in, uh, in Hilbert space. What do we mean by array? You know that uh, we, we are working in Hilbert space, which is a linear vector space endowed with a scalar product. And if you take a vector, I'm going to use the direct notation throughout my talk. And actually we know that because of the probabilistic interpretation, the probabilistic meaning of the wave vector, okay, we actually, a vector does not identify in a unique 
uh, uniquely uh, a state because I can multiply a vector by uh, a phase, okay? And I get an equivalent physical, uh, that will represent an, uh, exactly the same physical um, preparation, okay? So actually what I have to do has to normalize, first of all, my vector because uh, the mod square of our vector will represent the, the total probability, so it should be equal to one. And then we should uh, uh, declare equivalent vector that just differ by total phase. And that will give us an equivalence class of vector that we call array. And actually a pure state is uh, such array, okay? So uh, a, a normalized vector up to an overall phase. Actually, we, as we will see when we talk about uh, open system, we need a, a more general definition of state, which is that of a mixed state. A mixed state is actually an ensemble, so a collection of states, so psi j. Each psi j is a possible array in the Hilbert space, each of them with a given probability pj. So we are thinking of situation in which we, do, we are not able to prepare our system in a specific psi state, but for, for example, we, are, we just know that we are able to produce some bunch of electrons. Some of them are with spin up and some of them are with spin down, okay? With some probabilities. And so we actually have an ensemble, a collection of particles with di in different states, okay? Of course, PJs are probabilities, so they are positive numbers smaller than one and they sum up uh, to one. Okay, and both the pure and mixed states can actually be represented in a unique, in, in a unique way with, through what we call a density matrix. So it's actually a matrix which is obtained by taking the projector psi j, psi j, the cat times the bra, which is a, a, a matrix uh, weighted by the corresponding probability. You just see that if you have a pure state, there will be just one element. This sum actually will consist of only one term, okay? And it can be proved that this uh, matrix is actually a bounded operator on, of uh, norm less or equal to one, is a self-adjoint operator, definite positive of unit trace. And actually rho squared is equal to one if and only if it represents a pure state. So actually just uh, given by a single vector of the Hilbert space and not by an ensemble. Uh, you can uh, read these uh, properties by just thinking that since you are working with the self-adjoint operator, you can actually diagonalize it. And all the other properties actually mean that the eigenvalues of this operator are positive numbers. Uh, and uh, less than one, as I said, by the boundedness uh, conditions, and which sum up to one because the trace of an operator is just the sum of the eigenvalues. And uh, therefore, these eigenvalues essentially are exactly those that uh, those ob the objects that represent the probability. Okay, and you can see that rho square equal rho. Uh, so rho is pure if and only if these eigenvalues are actually all zero but one. And these uh, only no, the only non-zero uh, eigenvalues are actually equal to one. Okay, so these are properties that uh, the row matrix has to be satisfied. We will come back to these properties. We will use these properties later on in the, in the talk. Okay, this is uh, as uh, states are concerned. Then we know that uh, we need to define what an observable in quantum mechanics is. And we know that an observable in quantum mechanics is defined by a self-adjoint operator of the Hilbert space. A self-adjoint operator is something very special, okay? Because uh, uh, there is a theorem that uh, states, the so-called spectral theorem, that states that if we, we have a self-adjoint operator, we can actually rewrite it as a sum of projection operators uh, where uh, uh, as, as a sum of projection operators with coefficients that are the eigenvalue of our operator. So if you actually solve the eigenvector equation, a psi n equal lambda n psi n, and we find the set of all possible eigenstates that will form an orthonormal set, as we know, uh, forget about the genesis for the moment, and uh, rho n 
is uh, if you define the uh, density metric associated associated to each eigen uh, vector that will give us a projection operator. And we can exactly write A as the sum over N of lambda N, where lambda N is the corresponding eigenvalues times the projection operators. And once you have uh, the, the composition, it's very easy to write down the expectation value of this operator on a generic state rho. Let me remind you that rho represents a generic uh, pure mixed state by simply taking the trace of rho a, okay? If, if you do this uh, uh, calculation for a generic pure state, psi psi, and you decompose the, sta the state psi in the orthonormal basis of eigenvalues of the operator we are looking at, you immediately recognize that the average value of this operator is simply given by the sum over all possible eigenvalues weighted by the coefficients n uh, mod square, okay, which are given therefore the probability of the uh, corresponding eigenvalue. This is something that you know very well from standard uh, elementary quantum mechanics. Actually, this uh, is also connected to measurement theory. Okay, this uh, I mean this result has a very nice and important interpretation if you think about uh, what the measurement in quantum mechanics is. Because if you now want to measure the observable A on such a state, the psi, as we have defined it here, then we know that the, the outcomes of such a measurement are not deterministic, okay? The outcomes can be any of the possible real eigenstate of our operator, lambda n, and the probabilities uh, with which we find such eigenvalues are exactly given by this coefficient cn square. So this result of the average of an observable is actually clearly the average in a probabilistic uh, sense, okay? The other thing that I would like to recall is that actually a measurement in quantum mechanics is destructive, okay? Because after the measurement, the system is no longer in the state of psi or rho, but it will have collapsed to the eigens, to the corresponding eigenstate of uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue that has been measured. Okay, so these are two properties of the, a measurement in quantum mechanics that you should take into consideration. Okay, uh, I'd like to say I would like to say a couple of other things about the general quantum mechanics uh, to finish, let's say, uh, 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 the discussion. Let me remind you that a closed system, uh, quantum mechanical system evolves according to Schrodinger equation. Okay, so we have a, a specific operator, a specific observable that we call Hamiltonian H that actually determines how the system evolves. And we know very well that this generates actually what we call a unitary evolution because a wave function psi of a time t, psi of t, can actually be obtained starting from the wave function time t equal zero through a unitary operator, u of t. So ut is a unitary because u of t dagger is equal to ut minus one, which is actually also u equal to ut of minus t. And uh, this is what we write if you have a pure state. So if you are looking at the vectors in the Hilbert space, this uh, uh, formula actually translates uh, on, on an equivalent formula for density matrices. The evolution of a density matrix is obtained by sandwiching the initial density matrix by U of T and U of T dagger. And we all know that if the Hamiltonian H is time independent, this operator is simply the exponential of uh, our Hamiltonian. Okay, uh, we will never write down a Schrodinger equation, but we will write down examples of this unitary object, okay, in, in what follows. Finally, let me remind you that uh, we will need to consider a composite system, so system made up of more qubits or of the system and the environment. So we will need to work out with composite systems. In that case, the Hilbert space, the total Hilbert space, the total system will actually be given by the tensor product of the two Hilbert spaces. We will use it also today. Okay, so this is just to set up the basic quantum principle of quantum mechanics that you all sh should have studied before. But then uh, let's see what happens in a computer. Okay, and so start with the 
uh, uh, unit of uh, uh, storage of uh, quantum information. Okay, so what is the unit that you should use to store uh, information in, in a quantum setting? This is what, so this will be the analog of the bit. You know that the bit, the classical bit is a variable, is the simplest example of a classical system, which is just a binary variable. So a variable that can uh, take only the value zero and one, this is what we call a classical bit. And in the same way, uh, the simplest quantum system is what we can call a two level system. So we have just uh, a Hilbert space, which is generated by two vectors that we will call zero and one in analogy with what happened with the classical bit. This will be the quantum bit or qubit. But this is not the end of the story because we know that if you have a, a basis, this is what we will call the computational basis of our Hilbert space, actually the Hilbert space will be generated by means of the superposition principle so that a generic state of a qubit is actually represented by any linear combination of these two states. Uh, these two states can actually be represented by the canonical basis one zero and zero one in a two dimensional space. So a generic qubit is actually a two dimensional vector defined by two complex numbers A and B with the only restriction that uh, the sum of the modulus of A and B should square to one because of the normalization condition we were talking about at the beginning. In practice, we have many examples of such uh, uh, two-level system. You can think of an atom in which the electron can jump only between two possible levels, okay? You can think of a particle with spin one up, so that the two levels, zero and one, naturally spin up and spin down. Or you can think of a photon with the two possible states of polarization, okay? So we have many examples of uh, two-level system that can be used to actually uh, implement physically in a realistic way a, a two-level system and uh, for a qubit. Okay, so let me give you some represent different representation of such a, a, a system. In general, one can very easily show, I'm just going to give you a very short calculation in a second, that in general, a qubit can actually be written in the, in the way it is represented here. It's actually fixed by two parameters, two angles, theta, which ranges from zero and pi, and phi, that ranges from zero and two pi, in such a way that Q can be written as cos of theta over two, zero, plus e to the i phi sine of theta over two, one. And this is so simply because uh, we know that um, if you have uh, uh, the, if we start from the condition a square plus b square equal one, and thinking that a and b can be arbitrary uh, complex uh, uh, numbers, then it's very easy to think that a can be written as a phase, it's the i alpha times cos of theta over two, whereas b can be written as a different phase, e to the i beta sine of theta over two. So if you write Q now, which is A zero plus B one and substitute A and B as we have defined here, you see very well that you can write it as E to the E alpha times cos theta over two zero plus E to the I beta minus alpha sine of theta over two, sorry, one, okay? And this is it because you can define beta minus alpha as phi and you can forget about the total phase that we have in front because you know that the, uh, quantum states are defined up to an overall phase, okay? So essentially this is the most general representation you can think of, uh, of the state of a qubit. And uh, from this uh, representation, you recognize very easily that actually what we are representing geometrically are uh, through these uh, two angles is actually two dim the surface of the two dimensional sphere. Okay, as it is represented in this picture. Okay, so we have actually a surface of a two dimensional sphere, which is called a block sphere. Okay, this is as far as uh, we are looking at vectors in the Hilbert space. Okay, let me give you some examples 
Okay, so for example, the north and south pole of this two dimensional sphere are exactly the state zero and one that we were that we started with. Okay, and so zero and one will form what we call the Z basis or computational basis because it refers to the zero and one of the classical setting. But uh, of course, we can use different bases. For example, you can take as a basis the two extreme points along the x-axis. So this is the, the plus or minus uh, basis. And you can very easily check from the definition of the previous slide that the, the plus vector is actually one of the square root of two of zero plus one. So this is the linear combination of zero and one. Whereas the minus vector, which is at the other end point of the sphere along the x axis, is one over square root of two, zero minus one. Okay. And in a similar way, you can take what is called the y basis by taking the two points of the two dimensional sphere that lie on the y axis. And this is the representation in terms of the angles theta and phi that we were saying before. Okay. We will use this plus. Minus basis quite a lot uh, in, uh, in the future. Okay, and the zero one, which is a computational basis. So, but uh, uh, in some other context, also the y basis can appear. Uh, okay, uh, so let me, we, we talked here about vectors. So, so I gave you a representation of our state in terms of vectors. But I'd like to discuss a little more about what happens if you look at uh, density matrices, because it's actually is a very important thing that we recognize while looking at the density matrices. And so also looking at the mixed uh, states. And indeed what I would like to do is to look at uh, uh, the density matrix. Uh, first of all, uh, the density matrix of a pure state. So of the state uh, Q, which is um, given here. Okay, so generic cube that you can write as a linear combination of zero and one with two uh, coefficients a and b. And I'd like to show you very easily that the density matrix corresponding to this uh, Q is actually the two by two matrix that is written here, okay? Let me just show you the steps, uh, the principal step in the calculation because that will be useful also for future uh, ideas. The idea that the row Q Okay, if you um, remind, recall the definition, it's just the cat Q times the bra Q. And so that will mean that we have to take A0 plus B1 uh, cat times the corresponding bra, which is A star 0 uh, plus B star 1. Okay, so now we can just... Uh, do some simple algebra, and we see that this will be just a square zero zero plus uh, a b star zero one. If I multiply the first and the last one, plus uh, b a star one zero. Sorry, I I moved away. I should go back. Uh, okay, here. No, I lost my calculation, sorry. Um, okay, so let me write the final expression that you get from the previous one. So, so we have a square, zero, zero, plus I'm writing in a different order, one, one, plus a star, a star b, one, zero, plus a b star zero one. Okay, this is just obtained by taking the bra and the cat in the definition of the density matrix. Now, the only thing is to see what are these uh, objects here, these projectors here. I'm just going to give you the calculation of just one of them, and then you can check all the others. For example, if you take zero zero, that will mean that you have to take the product of the two dimensional vector one zero with the corresponding bra. So uh, column vector times row vector. And this indeed is the two dimensional matrix, which is one zero zero zero. Okay. 
And, uh, and so you see that this is multiplied by a square, mod of a square, which is in fact appears exactly in the first coefficient of this method. So you can go on with all the other pieces to, to show that this is density matrix. Uh, I would like to compare this pure density matrix of a single qubit with a, with a mixed density matrix, a very peculiar density matrix in which I take a mixture, an ensemble of uh, the zero state with probability P0 equal A square with the one state with the probability P1, which is B square, okay? Then in this case, the row will just be given by P0, 0, 0 plus P1, 1, 1. And this is exactly the matrix uh, that you see here. Okay, and uh, why I'm showing you uh, those two methods is because you can see the difference between what we call and call a classic, classical mixture. So we're just having a, a, a bunch of particles. Some of them are in zero state, some of them are in the one state with some corresponding probabilities, a square and b square. With, and we can compare this matrix with the matrix that actually represent a quantum mixture, a mixture that you can attain by a linear superposition that classically you are not able to, to make. And you see that the two matrices are not the same, okay? And indeed they differ by the off diagonal terms, okay? A classical mixture is just diagonal here, as you can see. Whereas uh, the quantum mixture is not. And in the uh, off diagonal terms, you see A, B star, or the complex conjugate uh, quantity. And so this uh, um, uh, off diagonal terms actually contain the phase difference between the complex number A and the complex number B, and therefore are the ones that are responsible for the interference effect that can arise in quantum mechanics. So these off diagonal terms are, essen are essentially and uh, quantum, okay? They, they encode the quantumness of the matrix, okay? Uh, let me give you a problem if you want to think about it uh, for tomorrow, uh, okay? The idea is, uh, is the following. Maybe thinking of some example, of how to realize a, um, a qubit such as a spin one up particle or a photon with the different polarizations. Can you try to imagine uh, uh, an experimental setup in which uh, you are able to distinguish between uh, a, a quantum mixture and a classical mixture? Okay, try to think about it. Maybe we can uh, discuss it uh, tomorrow if you do not uh, find a solution to this question. Okay, so um, I think I can go on. Uh, is there any question? I don't think so. Okay, so um, actually, I'd like to give you uh, a, a different a representation. Okay, sorry, Elisa, oh, the sorry. question for two. Oh, sorry, yeah, okay, okay. the you, question you... for tomorrow. I've seen, okay. So let me go back and maybe write it. If I can add the page, I will, um, let's see. Uh, if I can add the page, a blank page, okay. So the question for tomorrow is the following, okay. Uh, so you see that we, we have two possible, uh, we have a quantum mixture. which is described as this matrix rho q, which is a square, b square, a star b, a b star a, and uh, a, what you call the classical mixture, which is described by this density matrix. Okay. So I would like to devise an experiment, a setup, an experimental setup uh, in which, uh, so imagine that I have uh, a bunch of particles. I can think that I can 
have one particle at a time, okay? So I, I organize a setup in which I will have some device that at the very end will give me some measure, okay? Some quantum measure. And I want to establish, what, and so I send one particle at, at each time. I have a lot of them, as many as I want. And at the very end, I'd like to decide whether my particles are in a quantum mixture or in a classical mixture. Okay, so if they're represented by are just a bunch of what, what do I mean physically in a classical mixture, it means that my particles are uh, some of them in the zero state with the probability P0, which is alpha square. And some of them are of type one with the probability, which is beta square. Okay. In the other, in the quantum mixture, instead, I have all particles in the state uh, A0 plus B1. Okay. But if I let me say why I'm saying so, because if you now make a measurement of the state, of course, the, uh, a quantum measurement. A simple quantum measurement will give you zero with the probability a square and one with the probability b square. Okay, so the result of these two cases look the same with a very simple uh, measurement in which just I try to establish if my particle is in the state zero or in the state one. Okay, so I need something slightly more complicated. Okay. Try to think if you can uh, devise an experimental setup to do so. Okay, so let me go back. Mm, no, uh, I think I was here. Okay. Um, uh, because I'd like to give you also a representation of uh, a generic uh, mixed state. We have seen that the pure state can be seen geometrically at the surface of a two-dimensional sphere, okay, in a three-dimensional space of coordinate x, y, and z. And indeed, this can be done also for a generic mixed state. And uh, the idea is actually uh, we are looking at the rho, the, the, uh, the state rho that we are looking at is a, a self-adjoint matrix, so therefore uh, is like an observable. So, and is a two-by-two two matrix for a qubit, okay, as we have seen. Any two by two matrix can actually be written as a linear combination of Pauli matrices, say sigma x, uh, sigma z, sigma x, and sigma y, okay? And the identity. That's very simple to prove that the identity and the three sigma and the three Pauli matrices actually form a basis for all two by two self adjoint matrices. So, uh, in general, what you can do, therefore, is to write down a stellified geometry matrix as a linear combination of the identity plus the Pauli matrices that we write in this way by defining a vector n, sorry, vector n, which is a three component vector n, x, n, y, and z that give us the a linear combination of the Pauli matrices. Now, it is not difficult to see that because of all the properties of density matrix that we have seen before, okay, actually lambda is equal one for a density matrix, not for a generic self-adjoint matrix. And this follows uh, because the trace of rho should be the one, okay? Rem uh, recall that the sigma matrix is a, a, a traceless. So the uh, trace uh, part of rho just come from the identity, okay? And so lambda should be one in order to have a unit uh, uh, trace. And then <coughs> uh, the positivity and uh, the fact that eigenvalues of rho are uh, in between zero and one implies that the fact that the vector n, this three-dimensional vector n should be of norm less or equal to one. Okay, so this idea is that uh, a generic uh, um, two by two self adjoint matrix that represents a density matrix, a mixed or a pure density matrix, should be of this type. So it's essentially specified by this vector n, which is a three dimensional vector of norm less or equal one. 
So you might uh, have recognized that actually we are back to the um, block sphere uh, representation, okay? And what we have in this block sphere, that if you are looking just at the surface of the sphere, so that the norm of the vector is one, we are actually looking at our pure state, as you were saying before. But if you go to the interior, because the norm of our operator is less than one, okay, you are actually representing a mixed state, okay, a generic mixed state. In particular, if you go right to the center to the origin of our uh, coordinate system, when n is equal to zero, then we find that rho is just i over two, and this is what is called the maximally mixed uh, uh, matrix, okay? So it's a matrix which has just two identical eigenvalues, which, is, which are one and a half and one half, and there's a maximal mixed state, okay? So the idea is a block sphere is actually a useful geometrical representation, not only for the pure state, but also for the uh, mixed state. So when we talk about the mixed state, we are in the interior of this two-dimensional sphere. Okay, actually for today, and in part also for tomorrow, we will not go back to mixed state. I just wanted to give you the general representation, geometric representation of that, because it's very useful. In the following, we will stick to pure states for qubits. Okay, uh, one last thing I'd like to, to stress about uh, qubits, that if you look at a generic uh, uh, superposition of zero and one with coefficients a and b, these coefficients a and b are linked to, to measurements, okay? In particular, to a measurement that allows us to establish whether a qubit is the state zero or the state one, okay? We represent such a measurement process with a circuit of this kind. So we have the, the qubit Q, which is the, our initial state. We make a measurement in the uh, dead basis, zero or one. And the, the result of our measurement is a classical bit. So will be the result will be the outcome will be either zero or one, but we know that the outcome is probabilistic because we might find zero with the probability which is a square, and we might find one with the probability which is a, a absolute value of b square. And also we know that after such a measurement we have destruct we have destroyed uh, our state because uh, after the measurement uh, our qubit is no longer in this state but it is in zero or one respectively. Okay, and so the, the coefficients A and B, we know I have a, a probabilistic interpretation if you look at the measurement uh, process. Okay, so having said so, let's try to go to the last part of our principles. So if you want uh, seeing what the state of a qubit is, what it means to make a measurement of a qubit, and uh, the connection to the probabilistic interpretation. We have also seen that uh, we have a unitary evolution of a quantum system. So now I would like to discuss what we mean by unitary evolution of, uh, of a qubit, which is the simplest quantum mechanical system you can think of, uh, to discuss what uh, uh, a gate is. But maybe I should stop to see if there are some more questions about this first part. Okay, so qubit and measurements of a qubit, okay, of a single qubit. Okay, it seems not. Paula, I think there's no, I don't see if somebody has raised the I'm, hands, but the... I'm just checking, it doesn't seem that anyone uh, uh, raised their okay. hand. So don't be shy. Ask question. It's important. Yeah, don't, 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 don't worry. Also, okay. I just wanted to tell that if you have some question while Elisa is speaking, just write in the chat. Don't worry because I will not interrupt her un until I, I see that it's possible to interrupt her. So just okay. write. But do question. interrupt me if there's something that you're not understanding, which is very important. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
so, so I can go on and start discussing what uh, a gate is. The gate is actually something that is representing a unitary transformation. So it's a represent evolution of our qubit, of a state of our qubit. Of course, it's a linear because linearity is something which is essential of quantum mechanics. So we want to preserve linearity and it should be unitary, okay? So if you think that we are working on a block sphere, so a qubit is just a point on the surface of this uh, two-dimensional uh, sphere, on the surface of this uh, three-dimensional sphere, then you can immediately understand that actually geometrically, a unitary transformation is nothing more than a rotation. So we are moving one point, Q, which is characterized by these coefficients A, B, to another point, which is characterized by the coefficients A prime, B prime, which should, should uh, still be on the sphere, okay? So we are just making a rotation on this uh, uh, surface, two-dimensional surface of the three-dimensional sphere. So this object U that we are calling a gate, is actually just a rotation on, on geometrically, okay? And algebraically, this is just a two by two matrix because we're sending the vector AB into the vector A prime, B prime. So it's a two by two matrix with some coefficients, A, B, C, D, in such a way that this matrix is unitary. So U, U dagger should be U dagger U equal to identity, okay? Let me remark here something very important that we'll go, to which we will go back tomorrow. That uh, um, you, being unitary, U is also invertible, okay? This is actually a unitary matrix as a property that the inverse is equal to the dagger of the matrix, which means that we can always reverse such a transformation, okay? So any quantum gate is reversible, okay? This is something to keep in mind. We'll come back to this point uh, tomorrow because actually something quite different with what usually happens in classical uh, computation, okay? We have a lot of example of gates in, uh, in classical computation, which are not reversible, okay? And we'll come back to this point uh, tomorrow. Okay, so now that we know what uh, uh, a gate for a single qubit is, we can give some examples, okay? And, oh, sorry, actually, let me give first a, representa a representation of the most general evolution operator or unitary operator, okay, for a qubit. So as I was saying, it's just a rotation of the sphere as it is shown in this picture, okay? So I can think of representing such a rotation by composing in an appropriate way, a rotation about the X, the Y and the Z axis, okay? This is what uh, for sure I can do. I can represent any rotation uh, to the main on a, on a sphere by using a suitable combination of rotation about the three axis. Of course, I can add also the identity. I need to add also the identity. And indeed, it is not difficult to prove that I can represent any rotation in the way it is written here, the exponential of n dot sigma, okay? Where n represents the axis of rotation. And uh, thanks to the algebra of uh, Pauli matrices, which is written here, one can easily prove from, I mean, doing some algebra, some two-dimensional algebra, that this exponential is actually given by the cos of t of, of the identity plus sine of t of the operator n dot sigma, which is again of the kind of the operator we were looking at before. So the, the, the uh, coefficient t, which is here, usually we interpret it as a time during which we perform the evolution of Hamiltonian, which is essentially this one. So we can read this our Hamiltonian, the one that is generating our evolution. Uh, geometrically, this time t is just uh, the angle is equivalent to an angle of rotation on the block sphere, okay? So we can tune the angle of rotation by letting our Hamiltonian uh, act uh, for, with the specific time t, okay? So we trade the time with the uh, uh, angle of rotation. And in doing so, you can very easily see that using such an evolution, you can go from any point 
to any other point on our uh, block sphere, okay? And we use a, a graphical representation of such a gate, which is this box with the new inside. And so this uh, uh, picture actually represents uh, the simple circuit you can think of with an, an input uh, qubit, Q. We operate on it with this uh, unitary operator U, and then we'll transform it to a different qubit, so to a different point on the block sphere, which is, will be our output, okay? Of course, so this is a two by two matrix, so you can act on the vector and calculate what is the output. So let's see some examples. And in fact, the first example I'd like to, uh, to give you is a, a, um, the, the so-called X gate, which is actually nothing but the uh, X uh, Pauli matrices. When we talk about gates, usually we do not call sigma X, but we use the symbol X itself, okay? To represent the gate. So the gate X is represented by the two by two matrix, zero, one, one, zero. And uh, you can very easily see that from a geometrical point of view, this represents a rotation of, of an angle pi about the X axis, okay? And you can see very easily that uh, what you are doing, if you apply X to, to the initial state, which is zero, you are sending it to one. You can just apply this matrix to the state uh, uh, let me remind you that this state is just one zero. So if you apply it, you get one, which is the state is zero one, okay? So very simple calculation. So it shows you that the matrix sends zero to one and vice versa. If you apply it to the state one, which is zero one, you get the state zero, which is one zero, okay? So you are actually switching the role of zero and one and so that is uh, the uh, quantum knot gate. So this is equivalent to the knot gate in classical physics. It's switching between the two elements, zero and one, okay? And if you want, we can represent this in what uh, is usually called the truth table, in which you list what happens to zero and one when you apply this, uh, this gate, okay? This operation, this unit operator. Um, okay, actually, I would like to see what it does on a generic qubit, because as I was stressing many times, a generic qubit is not, can be neither zero nor one, but it can be on, on, in a linear superposition. And so what I would like to show you in, in very short, uh, in just a few lines of calculation, that the result of the X gate on a generic qubit is a, a new qubit in which I have exchanged the two coefficients, A and B. Why is this so? Let me just give the proof. The idea that I want to apply the gate X to Q, okay? That means to apply X to the linear combination A0 plus B1, okay? Let me remind you that X is linear, okay? That means that I can, go inside and apply x directly to zero in the first addend or to one in the second addend, okay? So in order to calculate what x does on a generic qubit, I just need the truth table that is telling me what x does on zero and one. And so I immediately get that uh, a, the, the resulting state is a1 plus b0, okay? Which is exactly, written in a slightly different way the state, okay? So linearity then allows us to calculate what a gate does on any state of, of a qubit, okay? Um, uh, let me notice, so that is actually a generic uh, rule. I just uh, exploited it uh, to, to show you the action of X, but you can use this generic rule for linearity for any gate that you can think of. Uh, let me stress also a, a, an important property, which is the one which is given here, that X square is equal to identity. Of course, you can check, do so by applying X twice to a generic qubit, but let me check this property by using the matrix representation, okay? So if uh, uh, I remind you that the X Lisa, is just- Lisa. Yes? 
sorry, there is a message in chat that I think it requires a quite a fast answer. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, you're right. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the question is asking me in the previous slide, I wrote to the commutator, uh, the anti commutator. Uh, it said that uh, had to be the commutator. Sorry. Yes. So thank you uh, for. Uh, for seeing that, I will correct it in the PDF file I'm going to leave you. Thanks. Okay. It was just a typo. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you for you to you for for the remark. Okay. Just I just wanted to show you that also the matrix fermentation can be very powerful to make calculation. Because if I remind you that the X is uh, this matrix, this off diagonal matrix, then to calculate X square, you just need to take the square of this matrix. Okay. And that is very easily to see that I simply get uh, by doing the matrix multiplication the identity. Okay. So the, the, this uh, property X square equals identity is very easily proved by looking at the matrix representation. Okay. So this is the X uh, uh, gate, which as I said to you, is a quantum version of the NOT gate, which is uh, a very important gate in uh, classical uh, in, in computation. But uh, of course you can think of doing a similar construction for all the other, for the other two Pauli matrices. So I can use the Y, matrix, which is just the sigma y matrix, or the z matrix, which is just uh, this. For example, the z matrix is diagonal, is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So that will send the state 0 in itself and the state 1 in minus 1, because of this uh, second diagonal element, which is, which is a minus 1. OK. And as before, you can actually see that the problem metrical point of view, if you look at the action of these matrices on the block sphere, they actually give uh, represent an angle pi now about the y and the z axis respectively. And again, very yeah. easily you can check that uh, because of the properties of, of the... Uh, oh, I'm going to the question in a, in a second, okay? Let just me finish this slide because the question brings me back. Okay, uh, let me notice just that y square and z square is the identity, and that actually can use uh, uh, rotation about x, y, and z axis to write down the most generic rotation on, on the sphere. And uh, I'm not going to use it much, but uh, I, I wanted to uh, to show it to you that the most generic rotation can actually be written in terms of three coefficients, phi, lambda, and theta, in the way that is uh, uh, given here in the uh, bottom line of this uh, slide. Okay. Um, question. Okay. When you talk about a mixed quantum state, do you mean entangled states? No. Okay. Uh, entanglement, we will see tomorrow. Okay. Has something to do with a, a, a system which is a composite system. So it's made up of two parts. And we say that the two parts are entangled. Here I'm looking, maybe I can go back to the, uh, uh, to the slide of the matrix. Mm, here, OK. Uh, the, um, uh, here I'm just looking at state of a single qubit. Okay, so it's an indivisible object. That it's not a composite object; it's just a single qubit. Okay, and uh, uh, when I talk of a mixed state, uh, uh, I'm thinking that I have a bunch of them. Okay, so I have uh, I can reproduce my qubit many times. Okay. And this is just what uh, we, uh, uh, a mixture in the sense of classical statistical physics, okay? So some of, uh, if I have many of them, if I have an ensemble of them, I reproduce it many times, some of them will be in a, in a given state, for example, zero, okay? And some of them will be in another state, for example, one with some given probability. So this is exactly what we do in classical statistical physics, okay? We have two possibilities here, zero and one, with relative probability, okay? 
And this is what we mean by mixed state, and this is why we call it a classical mixture, because that's exactly what happens uh, in classical uh, statistical mechanics, okay? In classical probability. Here, instead, we are making a linear superposition, okay, which is allowed only in, class, in quantum physics, okay? And it's true again that A and B have a probabilistic meaning, but here they are quantum amplitude, probability amplitude, okay? Not the probability. And this is what makes the difference because you find here this cross term A, B star, which are um, uh, encoding the interference effect that you might have because of probability amplitudes in quantum mechanics, okay? And so we are not talking at all about entanglement, okay? Mixed density matrix can exist uh, only for, uh, for uh, single uh, particle states. Maybe there is another there question. Is also, uh, th there is uh, Leonardo with raised hand. So I would, I would, will ask Leonardo to unmute himself and uh, speak. Sure. And then we will get back to the chat where I see another question. Oh, okay, so sure. Leonardo, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, so my question has to do perhaps with an extension uh, uh, to what you said. So if if we think about, as, as you showed, I don't remember on, on which slide, uh, uh, mm -hmm. if we think of density operators are, as also uh, uh, possibly being represented in terms of a block sphere, then would it be correct to yes. say then that the uh, application of a unitary operator does not change the degree to which a state becomes uh, more or less? Yes, more? okay. Uh, we will see it in the last lecture, actually, what happens to mixed states, okay? But uh, uh, let me, uh, of course, you can apply a rotation, or maybe I can go back to, to the picture you were mentioning. Uh, maybe this one, All right, okay. And uh, no, yeah. uh, I want to go to the uh, okay presentation. Okay, and uh, a unitary U, a unitary operator U, is a ro just a rotation. When I mean a rotation, I mean that the radius is not changed. Okay, so if I start from a mixed state, that the mixed state will be on a surface of a smaller sphere. Okay of radius, which is uh, the modulus of n, okay? And uh, so that uh, point will be moved uh, on this uh, uh, surface, okay? Yes. Uh, in the same way, it will be the same rotation, okay? But the rotation does not change the uh, radius, okay? So we will not move, let's say, from, the surf from a surface to another one, okay? Right. We will see that when we actually will deal with open systems, so we think that the system is not closed, but is, is uh, uh, in interaction with the environment, that does not longer hold true, okay? And we will be able to move also uh, transversally and uh, from the outside to, toward the interior of, of the sphere. We will see it uh, in the last lecture, okay? But uh, as far as we are looking at unitary transformations, unitary transformation do not change the modulus, you know, right? Yeah. They just change the angles, okay? So the radius will be conserved, okay? Yes, thanks. Is that answering your question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. It's important. It's a nice... Uh, uh, it's important to understand what's happening. So I go back to the chat. Does it matter the path we take on the block sphere from input to output state? Okay. So, okay. The idea is the following. Uh, we will see it in a moment. A different, uh, of course, I can use a different rotation to go from one point to another. There are many of them, okay? Actually an infinite number, okay? That means that if I want to achieve a given result going from a single state to another single state, I can represent that operation in many different ways, okay? And that as we will see later on, that means that there's not a unique circuit that I can construct to represent an algorithm, okay? A specific result that I want to achieve, okay? There are many ways to do so, actually an infinite number of them, okay? But the you that you choose will choose a specific path, 
okay? So each U will give you a specific path, a specific rotation that you might uh, so, uh, might want to represent uh, in a different way. I'll come back in a moment uh, to, to this uh, question anyhow. Other questions? I don't see anyone else. See. Okay. So actually now I'd like to show you a, 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 some other examples now. The first one is actually a gate, which is, I find it very interesting, very appealing from a let's say, conceptual point of view. Because uh, let's think what can happen classically. Classically for a single bit, actually I have very little freedom. Either I do the identity or I do the not, okay? I have no other freedom, okay? And uh, 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 I can make life a little more interesting if I introduce what is called the fuzzy logic. I don't know if you have ever heard of it. So I can think that I can transform a, a, a bit, a classical bit to zero or to one, not uh, deterministically with the identity or with the not, but probabilistically with the classical probability. So I will say that the outcome of my gate will be zero with the probability P uh, or one with the probability one minus P, okay? So this is what is called the fuzzy logic. It's actually a logic which is used a lot also in um, dish washers or the program that, uh, in, so in appliances at home. So something that is used quite a lot. Uh, and anyway, what I really, so you have more freedom if you want than just these two gates if you use uh, what is called the fuzzy logic. Anyhow, they're using classical probabilities, so we are using uh, positive numbers in between zero and one, okay? No way. So given that, you can think that, you can imagine that there's no way of devising a gate whose square is a knot, okay? Because, uh, 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 think about it if you want, you can discuss it tomorrow again. There is no gate that uh, applied twice can give you the dot, okay? And what is interesting is that in quantum mechanics, it actually does exist, okay? Just because we have complex numbers. And indeed, the, the, the not gate, uh, the uh, not gate, as you were saying before, is uh, the matrix uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, and the eigenvalues, uh, of this matrix are plus or minus one, as you know very well. And so in order to take the square root of this gate, I actually have to take a square root of a minus one, okay? So I need a complex number. And if you want, you can check very easily that uh, this matrix is not unique as usual with complex numbers with the square root, but the, the matrix that I'm writing here is actually the square root of the knot gate, okay? That you can imagine here in, uh, in this, con this quantum context. And this is just a, another example I wanted to give you, give something that is showing you that uh, with the uh, quantum mechanics, with the quantum physics, we can do something that in classical physics we cannot do, very, in, in a very straightforward way. Then uh, let me introduce an, a, a last uh, gate that I call R phi gate. Uh, which is the one that uh, is given here, that as you can see, gives the zero state invariant and just multiply one uh, by a phase. So that uh, inserts a phase difference between zero and one, uh, something that is very much used in uh, quantum computation. We will encounter it again. Let me just give you simple examples. Actually, I think I will give you, leave you this as an exercise. So let me leave this an exercise. Okay, instead of doing the calculation. What I would like to show you is that uh, I can compose such gates. For, for example, I can start from zero or one, apply X, and then apply this phase difference gate, this phase gate R, and then Z. And uh, I will find uh, the, that uh, zero has gone into minus e to the minus i phi one, and one has gone to has gone to zero. In matrix notation that uh, correspond to this, okay? 
Let me uh, make a remark. As you see, if I look at the circuit, I start from the input from the left, I apply X, R, and Z, one after the other to get the output. When I write it in the matrix notation, of course, the first gate to act is a matrix on the right, which acts on the vector, then apply R, and then apply as the last one, Z, remember that. And you can use a matrix representation of X, R, and Z to show that indeed, so that will be one minus one, zero, zero, times one, e to the i, phi, zero, zero, times, uh, zero one uh, one zero. So it's just a matter of multiplying these matrices uh, to find the matrix notation for this uh, simple circuit. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Um, Paola, uh, I have until uh, uh, 45 minutes or what is the time I have? I forgot. Paula, our, are you there? Lisa, it's Katerina speaking. Yeah, I confirm it's uh, uh -huh. up to 45. 45, okay, thank you. So, um, sorry, I, I forgot you, uh, to switch on my microphone. I'm sorry. No, no, don't, don't worry. Okay, I just wanted to be sure. Uh, uh, I'd like to give you a last example of, of a gate, which is, however, very, very important. Okay because uh, uh, it's actually uh, the, the gate that uh, makes use of uh, superposition principle, which is truly quantum. As you know, we don't have in quantum mechanics, because if you go back and look at uh, the X, Y, and Z, or even the phase uh, um, gate that I showed you before, they're essentially just reshuffling between zero and one up to some phases or coefficients or signs. Okay, and so therefore they're somehow mimicking what we have in classical physics where you have just the zero in the one state. This Adamar gate here that instead I'm introducing here is actually the gate that making use of linear superposition. So the output is a linear superposition of states and that is used a lot to, um, to, to show the powerful, uh, the how powerful uh, quantum computation uses. So let me define it. It's defined by this matrix representation. So it's one over square root of two of the matrix one, 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 minus one. Again, you can very easily check that the square of this matrix is the identity. Okay, so it satisfies the same properties of X, Y, and Z gates that we have seen before. But let's see what H does. Okay, so uh, let's apply H to um, zero. So we will do one over square root of two or one, one, one minus one over the state zero, which is one zero. You immediately see that you get the state one over square root of two. Uh, sorry, I, I okay. Um, one and uh, one. Okay, and this can clearly be written as a combination zero plus one over square root of two. So this is exactly what is written here. And you can do the same with the, uh, I, I'm, I'm coming back to the question which is in the chat in a moment because I'm going to give you an exercise, okay? Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and so uh, what I'm getting by applying H to zero is a state plus that we define at the very beginning, the one which is on the block sphere on the extreme of the positive X axis. Okay, so this is state plus, which is a positive linear combination of zero one normalized with one over square root of two. Whereas if you apply it to one, let me remind you that you can get the state one by applying uh, the gate x to zero. So I'm just starting with zero, apply x, I get one. And now if I apply h, as you can see very easily by doing the calculation, this I will leave it to you. This will give you one square, square root of two, one minus one, okay? And so that will be the linear superposition of zero and one with the minus in between, 
okay, and the correct normalization over square root of two. So that will, will send you uh, zero in uh, in the state plus and one in the state minus, okay. And um, so it's a very interesting. Uh, so it's essentially changing from the that the basis to the x basis, okay. And uh, we will use it a lot tomorrow. This gate. And coming back to the question, actually, I'm leaving here an exercise to you, okay, uh, to show you that uh, uh, this uh, simple composition of uh, gates. So starting from zero. Let's uh, um, apply first H, this method, then the phase uh, R, okay? And then uh, H again. This should be the result, okay? I'm writing the result to try to do the calculation to see if you are getting it. And also try to show that actually this combination is actually a, a proportional up to a, uh, a phase, a total phase, to a rotation of pi over two, okay? Uh, uh, and let's see what happens. So essentially, uh, let me try to understand what we can interpret physically with the circuit. I, I'm starting from the uh, qubit in the North Pole, okay, which is uh, so up, uh, spin up, uh, if you want. Apply H, H is making a rotation of pi over two, bringing it to the x-axis, to the positive x-axis, as is saying here. Then I rotate it and then I bring it back, okay? Uh, H, remember H is the inverse of itself because the H square is R. So this combination of rotation is a rotation of pi over two, okay? Of uh, uh, zero with the, because essentially the idea is that these coefficients here is proportional to to cos of pi over two, whereas this is uh, proportional to sine of pi over two, okay? I leave to you this kind of uh, calculation. So think about it. Uh, okay. Uh, um, try to do the calculation that we should uh, make you your uh, geometrical intuition clearer. Yes, Adamaro was a French mathematician and it's clearly in his honor that uh, this, this gate. Okay, let me see what I have here. Okay, so I have a final comment before stopping and then we'll go back to composite systems tomorrow, uh, which is actually to give you, goes back to one of your previous question, uh, actually to achieve a given result. So, to perform a global general, I mean, complicating transformation, we can actually use different uh, gates, okay? Composition of different gates, okay? So that the circuit can actually be written in many ways. And this is because there are identities between uh, the matrices we are using. For example, you can show, I leave that to you, that if you multiply H with that, with H again, you get the simply X. So if you are thinking of a complicated circuit, which has H, Z, and H, actually you can substitute the three gate, the, the composition of these three gates with just X. So that will simplify your circuit a lot. And then I'm just giving you other examples. Or you can write a given operation like first Z and then H, like here, but you can also write it as first H and then X. So you can choose either to use X or Z as uh, you prefer, or for example, that uh, might be useful if you have uh, a real computer that for which it's very easy to, to make a Z transformation, but for example, it's difficult to make an X transformation because then when you realize it on a real computer, you have to implement this physically and it might be easier to realize some transformation instead of other. So that opens actually a very interesting issue, a very interesting problem in that, that also having in mind on how your real computer works, okay? It might be important to realize your general algorithm, your protocol uh, with uh, the optimal set of gates, okay? 
So there is a problem of optimization of your circuit, the way you rely physically your circuit and also algebraically your circuit, which is a very important problem. If, if you go also on the pages of uh, quantum companies like IBM Q or Amazon or others, you, or at also there are many companies that have uh, pages about uh, quantum algorithm, you will see that uh, this problem of optimization is also uh, tackled or something very, very important. So the, the idea of optimizing uh, a quantum algorithm is, is a problem which is very important, actually also quite uh, difficult because the, to find the answer is not uh, so easy because there is infinite ways in principle to realize such uh, a given protocol. Okay. I think I, let me see. Uh, yes, instead tomorrow we'll start talking about uh, composite systems in particular two qubit still sticking to close the systems for the moment. The day after we'll start to talk about environment and open systems. And tomorrow we'll talk about entanglement. Okay, I stop here, I think.